Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well, I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. Today, I'm joined by a true pioneer, the creator of the polyvagal theory, Dr. Stephen Porges. Dr. Porges is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University, where he is the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. He is also professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina and professor emeritus at both the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Maryland. He's published more than, I think, 300 peer-reviewed papers across a wide array of disciplines and is the author of a number of books, including his most recent, which he wrote with his son, Seth, Our Polyvagal World, How Safety and Trauma Change Us. So, Steve, thanks so much for doing this today. How are you? I'm doing fine, and thank you, Forrest, for inviting me. I am uh, so happy that we're doing this again. We've talked on the podcast previously. People really enjoyed that conversation. And I'm guessing that most of our listeners probably have at least a cursory familiarity with polyvagal theory, but for those who don't, it probably makes sense for us to start at the beginning. And I would love a brief summary here. So if we were to kind of reduce the complexity of the theory and basically put it into a kind of a couple of sentences, I really say that it's about uh, understanding that our bodily state influences how we respond to the world and how we experience mm-hmm. the world. And so when our body's in a state of calmness, we see the world much more as benevolent, optimistic, engaging. And when our body's in a state of literally threat, uh, Mm. we call it it anxiety or stress, then the cues of the world are interpreted to be more as as threatening. My son, Seth, who wrote the book, really likes to simplify it and say, it's really about how you feel. Polyvagal theory is really, is about if you feel safe, if you feel safe enough, the world is a great place to be in. If your body's in a state of threat, the world's a dangerous place. So it's as simple as that. Polyvagal theory goes one step beyond that. So I'll start with the what I call the intervening variable and not to think of the world as being a stimulus and response world. Or if it were, if you were depressed, then operant conditioning would get you out of depression. If you were anxious, you could, in a sense, put it under stimulus control and you'd be fine. In fact, many people tried these things. They were not very effective. Uh, So we know that it's not merely the contingency with the external stimulus that our body's responding to. We have something in between, and that's that physiological state. But that physiological state carries with it a portfolio or a profile of what behaviors are literally Uh, emerge from it, or let's say comfortable in coming out of certain physiological states. So if your body is in a state of physiological threat, which means like fever or injury, your whole physiology is now shifted to be protective, but it affects your mental state as well. So you see people's faces not as being supportive, loving, and compassionate, but you see them as being evaluative. And remember, we're in a world where the signals are not signals of safety. Most of the signals are really signals of threat. So we're in a world in which education is evaluation, medicine is evaluation, everything work is evaluation. That's another way of saying that our body is being bombarded with signals of threat all the time. But we as social mammals, and this is really what our evolutionary heritage gives us, we not only respond to threat, we respond to signals of safety. And I think this is one of the important messages of polyvagal theory, which makes it an optimistic world perspective, that we can downregulate our stress, our anxiety, our threat reactions with signals of safety. And those signals of safety tend to be extraordinarily predictable. All you need to do is look at a mother calming her crying baby, and suddenly mm-hmm. you get the signals. And then you, if you see a person who's adopted a rescued dog or a cat, How do they talk to the cat or dog? They will use this prosodic intonation of voice. And that triggers in the physiology a compass. We know what our body wants. So that in your interviews, so far as for you, and you're the interviewer, you are broadcasting signals of safety to your interviewees. So if your voice were yelling at them or high-pitched anxious voice, they would be like this. They wouldn't even be able to find a word to respond to you. So that's polyvagal. So we know all this, but how do we implement it in our world, in our day-to-day life, or even in our education, in our science, in our social life, 
and in therapeutic growth. Yeah, got that. And that's a great summary, uh, Steve. I think that you chose well in terms of how long and how detailed to make it. So the uh, the name polyvagal comes from the vagus nerve, as you know much better than I do. And I like how you've really focused on this notion of like, how do we respond to threat? And under mm -hmm. what circumstances do we respond to different kinds of threats? Because that maps pretty nicely to these uh, three big systems that you talk about in your work a lot. So the three big systems are really physiological systems that are regulated in, in the autonomic or regulated by the autonomic nervous system. And what that really means is that our brain stem, our brain regulates our bodily organs. And mm -hmm. all of us have felt our, our palpitations of our heart in certain situations, we may start sweating, we may tremble. And some people under certain situations feel like they're gonna pass out and some do. And the point is the theory explains the mechanisms of this ability to engage others, to request engagement of others, to co-regulate. So let's say I feel a threat. What is the go-to system or a situation I should be orchestrating in my life? Another person. Because our biology evolved to be co-regulated by another person, or what I often say, another appropriate mammal, so a cat or dog or mm, person. Mm -hmm. For those who have experienced trauma, they like their pets or they feel safer with their pets than with humans. Uh, so the issue is our nervous system knows what the signals should be to turn off our threat responses. We kind of grew up in this world and the world says, you may feel this, but don't respond to it. So part of our trajectory is literally learning to be numb to ourselves. And mm. polyvagal theory says that this strategy of numbness has a physiological consequence because you're mm. turning off the feedback loops between the organs of your body and your brain. And so mm -hmm. over time, this numbness works, but so it, what's really happening, the neuroregulation of the organs are paying the price. One of the things that I really love about polyvagal and the real like breakthrough for me when I was learning about it is the notion that we have these three different ways broadly speaking, yeah. to oversimplify a little bit, of responding to different kinds of threats that map to these different systems in our body related to the vagus nerve. They're basically, we have a freeze response, we have a fight or flight response, and then we have this more relational response that you're really emphasizing here, Steve. Co-regulation, sitting in it in a way that feels good with another person. And one of the things that was helpful for me was the notion that all of these responses are adaptive in different kinds of ways. Uh, with our freeze response, you're mobilizing, you're hiding from predators, you're conserving resources. Uh, with the more mobilizing responses, you need to run away from predators or maybe mm. seek out food, whatever it is that is getting you into that movement. And then that relational social system, which drives like so much of the way that we are with other people and particularly allows us to stay safe with others. Because if you think about our sort of evolutionary heritage, the biggest threat to humans for much of our history has been other humans. So we learn ways to solve that problem through mm. those relational systems. Is that a fair summary? That's very good because what you did was you stepped in where I didn't give the answers. So you yeah. really were asking me before, what are the three circuits that I talked about in polyvagal theory? I talk about a ventral vagal system that is calming our body, but linked with the neuroregulation of our face and our voice. So we broadcast our physiological state in our voice and in our face. And in a sense, intuitively, everyone knows that. And that's mm -hmm. where we negotiate and we literally work in psychological space to convey signals of safety and to mitigate signals of threat, which is what you're talking mm -hmm. about, this negotiation. Then when that system gets retracted, it basically creates a platform for a very efficient fight-flight system. So in a sense, the newer ventral vagus, which gives you the social engagement, actually has a couple wonderful attributes. One in itself, it has these emergent properties of interacting, of smiling, of talking with a prosodic voice, but it literally can choreograph and co-op or repurpose our fight flight system, and now we call it play or dance. Mm -hmm. So we're mobilized, but we use our face, we use our voice. And so we really get exuberance, we get a full experience of life. And then if that social engagement system is uh, can repurpose that dorsal vagus, this older vagal circuit, 
that when recruited in, in defense shuts us down. It does that. It calms us now. And we now can share moments of intimacy where bodies conform with each other. It's just visualize a mother and the infant. So we can see that when that ventral vagus is on board, it can co-op everything. Now, you, you mentioned another very important point is that our defenses are not good or bad. They're adaptive. And this is critical when you watch a child in a state of tantrum. That nervous system mm. is in a state of threat. And yelling at that child is not going to uh, enable them to calm their body. It's going to gear it up. And I often say uh, in my talks, have you ever won an argument? Now, it's a very, uh, it's a reflective question. Because what we realize is that once we're in an argument, we are not very good witnesses. We're not mm. listening. We're not negotiating. We are in a survival mode. And arguments are not one. You have maybe someone being submissive, but you don't mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. a uh, reconciliation of ideas together in a shared agenda. And it takes decades to recognize that you don't win arguments, um, that you have to be, and that I see the weakness in our uh, development as a society, in our educational system, is that we haven't emphasized the importance of being a good witness to others. Mm. Even within the clinical world, especially in the world of trauma, we have people who talk about retribution to those who have been injured. And the issue is, if you're traumatized, that is not your priority. It's not retribution. Your priority is to be heard because mm. the trauma affected your boundaries of a concept of yourself. Mm. So by being witness, you now are recreating that boundary. And there's a healing component of just having a person be supportive. I love that you're talking about this now, Steve, because one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was the relevancy of polyvagal theory for people who have experienced you know, significant, unfortunate experiences, trauma, whatever, however you want to refer to it. Um, and one of the insights of the theory is that what we refer to as trauma is not just like a psychological state, it's actually a physiological experience, often of hyperactivation. And you're referring to safety experiences here, right? Like co-regulation with another person, the ability to engage, the, the nerves that drive expressions in the face in little uh, subtle ways that allow us to feel related to by another being. But people who have had considerable traumatic experiences, particularly what we would refer to as like complex PTSD, of course it can come from many different things, but complex PTSD tends to be particularly bad for this. Um, they often have a hard time getting to that relational stance that allows them to feel safe with another person, to feel regulated with by another person. So it becomes this kind of self-perpetuating thing where you can't feel safe, so you can't feel related to, so you can't feel safe. Um, and it's very difficult for people to deal with. Well, it's difficult if you try to figure it out cognitively. Because mm -hmm. when they try to figure it out cognitively, a, the person who's trying to figure it out feels shame and blame for not implementing, the, quote, the appropriate behaviors that would solve the problem. So they're treating it as a problem-solving task. And what they're doing is... I'm going to say violating one of the most important principles of the theory or how the theory can be applied to human experience is that is listen to your body, be aware of what your body is telling you. When we, I'd like to always kind of make this kind of broad statement. I learned much more about what it was to be a human from the world of trauma. I didn't learn it from my work in development or physiology. I learned it from the experiences of those who have been traumatized because they taught me what they had lost. And they lost this capacity to feel safe with another. They didn't lose the dream or the vision or the expectation that they would want to do that. They lost the, literally, the toolkit that enabled them to do it. Now, this goes back to what we define trauma as. I like to define trauma not by the event. It's not that events aren't important. And this is my discussion uh, about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Well, they're important. I don't mean to minimize that. But given the same experience or same event, the personal internalized experiences are going to be different. So the issue is, it's the response to the event that is critical. And this becomes extremely important in the world where people 
are literally functionally traumatized, their health and their whole psychological out outlook of the world changes by an event that others within our society say is trivial. Why, why are you reacting this way? And what we need to do is be respectful because we can't make the prediction of how anyone or even how we as an individual will respond. So we can't say, I got through that, you should. Now, to me, the most interesting thing that I was taught from the world of trauma was that signals of safety, which I had was, I was promoting and said, this is the way, uh, uh, you know, this is the world, we need more signals of safety. For a person who has experienced severe trauma, especially from a biological parent, from a home, from basically violation of trust in those that their nervous system had anticipated or was programmed to trust. Once that's violated, the body is says, sees signals of safety as signals of vulnerability. Mm. I developed an acoustic intervention called the Safe and Sound Protocol. I developed it as a stealth intervention, initially start with autistic kids and then moved into the world of trauma. The idea was that if you can signal the nervous system functionally the autonomic nervous system, that it's safe through enhancement of the intonation of vocalizations, basically it was computer-altered music, the nervous system would spontaneously open up and be accessible and available and engage. And it happened many times. However, with people with severe trauma, there were certain cases in which individuals found the prosodic music they were listening to extremely threatening or let's say anxiety producing and could not they became destabilized and could yeah. not listen yeah. and i had to figure this out because what it was is that the music the signals were working they would the body was hearing it processed by the brain going down to the viscera and this was the neuroception was working the body opened up but now we have interoception where the feelings of the body percolate up to the brain stem and up to the cortex. That hits consciousness. So the people with the trauma histories, when they listen to this, I should say some of the people, some, no problem. They listen to this, their body literally becomes accessible. So what happens? Their body starts to open up. The interoception goes up and is now interpreted within a history of memories of vulnerability and injury. Yeah, yeah. And wham. I'll give you an example. Uh, they were doing a uh, using it in in Poland for Ukrainian refugees, and they were wanting to work with kids. And I said, "Well, first you need to work with the mother because the child needs a safe parent to engage, and you can't in sense stimulate this safety response unless the mother can be reciprocal." So they put it on a woman. Uh, she lasted 42 seconds and pulled the headset off her ears. She came out of a war zone with a child. And what was her, her in a sense, physiological responsibility to be protected? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now she was literally being conned by the music to be accessible. And to be relaxing, yeah, yeah, totally. And therefore becoming more vulnerable as we, exactly. as we are as animals, you know, you show yeah. the... You show the soft underbelly and bad yeah. things happen to you, particularly if you've had that experience over and over again. Like just speaking personally for a moment, um, I wouldn't refer to myself as somebody with with a uh, acute trauma history or anything like that. You know, I had some difficult interactions with other kids growing up, as many people do, but that's about it. But nonetheless, you step into that social situation where for whatever reason, the group is actually co-regulating with each other. They're actually relaxed. Everyone's settling down. What happened to me the first couple of times that I was in that sort of a space? I became anxious. I yeah. got uncomfortable. I got buzzy. I stepped out of the room, whatever it was, because that felt spooky for me. It felt spooky for my body. And that's, again, somebody who hasn't had yeah. those kinds of acute experiences. So when I first started to see this happening, it was very disruptive to me yeah. because uh, personally, I I only want to be helpful. How could I, in a sense, create something that has, it's, in a sense, could have a counterindication that can trigger uh, things? And I got really upset. And I had to be told by the trauma therapist that who told me, calm down, we'll figure this one out. <laughs> they were soothing you there. That was good. They, they were. <laughs> this is, And what they really were telling me 
and they did it was they just need to slow the delivery down. Yeah. So it meant that it's like somatic experience with pendulation or titration. The nervous system can get shocked, but it needs time for it to recover so it can relearn or get repurposed to be welcoming. And so the very, I would say, brilliantly insightful therapist looked and listened to their clients, watched them, looked at their faces, looked at their muscle tone, and decided less is more, which was a principle of the intervention to begin with. And that was how basically I took out a lot of the sound to enable it to be processed more easily, but I had not thought about the duration. So now they were talking about less is more, meaning shorter duration. And over, over the years, it's been now five years or six years, it's been out there. Some of the therapists use only a few seconds every session. They use it until they get a response to the client's introceptive pathways, and they know it's enough. You're talking about what the appropriate working dose of this intervention is, basically. For the individual, yeah. and for the individual yeah. at, on that day. Uh, it, to me, it's remarkable how sensitive, uh, let's say, what trauma history, adverse history, not even using the word trauma, can retune the nervous system to be on hypervigilant, literally. And when we start talking about what is safety, it's basically turning off our hypervigilance. It, and I use words now like safe enough to be who we really are, because when we're not safe, we're just defensive. So there's so much here, and there are a lot of different places that I could take this. But just to kind of say this back to you a little bit, Steve, um, particularly in terms of takeaways for a person mm. who's maybe had uh, some difficult experiences in their life, whether or not they would refer to that as as a trauma history. So we're living in a world that's got a lot to be worried about, right? Whether it's what we're bombarded by on the news or it's just the realities of living a difficult life. And then what we're saying is, hey, you're somebody who went through these kinds of experiences. Your body is now literally experiencing safety as a kind of threat. Mm -hmm. And you're so you're experiencing threat as a kind of threat and you're experiencing safety as a kind of threat and the world's just sort of spooky in general, like, wow, that is a that is a difficult soup for a person to deal with. Um, and I'm some, sort of wondering where you go from here. So you're really describing uh, much of the world, especially much of the world that mental health providers live in. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this is, I mean, it's not an exaggeration what you're saying. And the answer really is, if your body's locked into a state of threat and signals of safety are threat, how do you navigate? And the answer is, slowly with great difficulty, but with the building of a trusting relationship. There has to be a degree of co-regulation. I have asked this question about uh, foster children frequently. And the issue is how do you work with foster children? I, and it's a subset of foster children who are taken away from their biological parents because of severe abuse. And what that means to me is they don't have a template of feeling safe with anyone. So the issue is when we feel safe with someone at some point in time, that becomes a top-down visualization that can be leveraged in developing one's therapeutic model. Whether it's an insight from polyvagal theory, the physiological interventions that you've developed, or just what you've learned over time, talking to a lot of really smart people about this, what do you think helps people, people get there, get into that experience? I think there are a couple basic steps. And the first step is what I call awareness. I think we're all on a journey of re-embodiment. In a sense, mm. part of what trauma does, or we don't even need the word trauma, we can say chronic stress, we can use the word anxiety, it doesn't matter. Underneath all those psychological terms is a physiology that has been repurposed to be locked into a state of threat. So, so the first thing is that awareness of our own physiological state. So the it focuses on our own awareness because what we also learn is that most people who are chronically stressed, who have adversity histories, all the same package, are numb to their body. And they, with that numbness, they also have a whole array of medical problems. And those medical problems are all, not all, but many, or if not most, are linked to dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. So the first point is that mental and physical illness are really commingled, intertwined, and a body in a state of threat produces both. 
And it's the nervous system's reaction because it can't service itself. It can't take care of its own organs in a state of threat because it's, it says it's kind of like a Star Trek model. Uh, when you're in the asteroid or someone's shooting uh, missiles at you, you need your defense shields. But defense shields take energy. Yeah. And now yeah. your propulsion and you're using your resources. Same thing with humans. When we're locked into a state of threat, our resources are pulled in. And in fact, fight flight is metabolically costly. We can't even maintain that. And that's in part why in the world of trauma, where there's chronic abuse in the history of many people, they shut down, they withdraw. This is part of dissociation a, in polyvagal terms, the dorsal vagus, which is this con it's a conservation system uh, that is being recruited to saying you can't keep fighting you need to disappear and you need to reduce your metabolic output. So this became, I think, the important uh, contribution of polyvagal theory in the world of trauma. It was the acknowledgement that disruptors didn't always elicit sympathetic fight flight. They often elicited a shutting down withdrawal, uh, dissociative response. And before polyvagal theory came out and started to make those broad statements or bold and broad statements, uh, many of the clients of trauma therapists were basically had gotten the wrong message. The message was, of course, you were in a fight or flight. Of course, you just don't remember it. As opposed to the true signal was that when the body goes into this shutting down defense, it's a life threat reaction. And to, in a sense, respect and to honor what the body was doing. So a survivor of, of rape might have passed out, but in passing out and not being oppositional and fighting, it might have saved his or her life. So we start to honor what the body is doing and not get angry at the body. So the dissociative people used to get angry at their body for not fighting or fleeing, as opposed to literally understanding this dance that the nervous system was doing to honor life, to keep that individual alive. Many people struggle with contextualizing why that freeze response kicked in for them during a traumatic experience. Yeah. And some people uh, are even dealing with the remnants of that kind of hyperactivation of hypoactivation yeah. um, of that shutdown response in the present day. And I'm wondering, what do you think helps people both come to terms with that or deal with any of the residual um, cascade from that? Yeah. Okay, so when the body shuts down, it, the body's also vulnerable. And sometimes if you pass out, you can get injured. It's not a priority to go to that, that part and, unless there's true life threat. And if it's repeated life threat, which some of these individuals have had in their own homes, the nervous system adapts and it adapts from moving from shutting down and passing out to freeze. And then it may adapt and go into dissociation. Mm -hmm. And each one of those stages is enabling the body to do more of its maintenance service of your organs. So yeah. we start seeing these strategies of survival embedded in the nervous system as something that needs to be honored and not as sense, uh, uh, embarrassed by. So mm -hmm. we start learning that everyone has this journey and some people's journeys are more difficult, but they have a nervous system who was their companion on it. I'm going to is just make a couple side statements here, and it's kind of an interesting one. Okay, I'm talking about the nervous system regulating visceral organs as being a major contribution to mental and physical health. Now, from a polyvagal perspective, it makes a lot of sense. From a basic medical perspective, which is end organ oriented, meaning you go to a specialist who looks at your organs. They don't, physicians do not have good tools to look at the nervous system regulation of organs. So it just sits outside and it moves into an area that used to be called medically unexplained symptoms or functional medical disorders or functional neurological or functional GI disorders because the end organ doesn't show pathology yet. So it's the misunderstanding of the regulation of that organ. Polyvagal theory sits in that space and says, it all makes a lot of sense 
because the nervous system regulates these organs and the nervous system is telling these organs that you're under a state of threat. And when it does that, it blocks that naturally occurring feedback loops between the brain and the organs that support the health growth and restoration of those organs. We need to teach physicians that what their responsibility, they need to recruit the patient's nervous system, nervous system as a collaborator on a joint journey of healing and health. So this is basically co-regulation and polyvagal theory now. But it was the notion that if we understand the signaling of that nervous system, that nervous system can be signaled not to be in defense, constrict and block blood flow to the organs that need to be healed, but literally can enable healing to occur. You have to understand the signals that enable the nervous system to regulate its own organs. So talking about those signals, one of the distinctions that you make that I think is really helpful for people is this distinction between feeling safe and being safe, which is essentially our ability to perceive threats accurately in different kinds of ways. Uh, we live in a world where we're not, we are literally taught not to believe our feelings. Mm. Let's take the, the, the child who has school refusal because his gut hurts. Mm. Now, from a polyvagal theory perspective, that chronic gut pain, because it's below the diaphragm, is a signal of life threat. So in a sense, his nervous system is detecting something of life threat. And the child is saying, I can't go there. It's too threatening to me. And what does the supportive parent say? Oh, don't worry. You'll be, you know, because the, the protective parent has to work, has to do their things, and they basically minimize the signals that they're getting because our society doesn't enable us to. So the child then is brought to a GI specialist. They start giving them certain drugs. The drugs uh, minimize the pain, but block even more the neural feedback to those organs. So you start getting another cascade. The, the issue is uh, there's a numbness that is occurring and our society does not support the acknowledgement that our bodies can tell us when we are in states of threat. So the mm -hmm. answer is, if we're in states of threat, like you were talking about going into the room, if you went in with a friend, or let's say you're younger, you go with a parent, the parent says, you can hold my hand, I'll walk you in here, you can stay close to me. And then over time, you'll feel more comfortable if someone introduces you to someone. So it's not like this, uh, I don't belong, saying this, you know, you start creating relationships. And suddenly the cues of vulnerability disappear and they're replaced with the enjoyment of the interaction. So the, the space has stayed the same. Most of other people's behavior has stayed the same, but there was one little key variable switch that changed how you perceived what was going on. Your physiological state changed, and that yeah. goes back to yeah. the very beginning of our discussion. Yeah. And it changes, uh, that's where a co-regulatory person enables you to regulate your physiological state so you become the best that you are. So Steve, a lot of people out there do not have a, um, I'm trying to find the right language for this, uh, a, a really secure base other person who's going to be that reliable nervous system that they can just bounce off of to help them regulate their system, get back to those experiences of safety, whatever it might be. They've got a tricky partner. They've got tricky mm. parents. Maybe they don't have a good therapist that they can rely on for one of a million different reasons. You kind of see where I'm going here. Like, How can we start to give this gift to ourselves, maybe, for lack of a better way of putting it? I mean, you're asking the hard question, and the other question is a personal question. How, mm. What was my journey? And okay, my journey uh, took a lot of time uh, because I had to figure out, basically, I had to figure out where I came from. The part that we really want to emphasize is that self-awareness is where we've kind of started the discussion as well. And I think this is important because when we talk about any form of therapy, we talk about a journey of re-embodiment where we become comfortable within our own body. Within mm -hmm. polyvagal terms, what we're really saying is that the feedback loops that nurture us are allowed to nurture us. They're not being uh, displaced by our defense shields that we need the energy to fight off predator. It's not Star Wars. We can, in a sense, identify threat 
we can deal with that, and then we can go to safe places and allow our bodies to heal. The safe places uh, ideally require safe people. Mm-hmm. But we, there are things that you can modify on that journey. And there are a lot of social mammals. I'm talking about cats, dogs, and horses. And there'll be a lot of people who are on your podcast who may have had a trauma history, but they co-regulate with their pets and they mm-hmm. trust their pets and their pets trust them. And the point is that they have learned to literally claim their evolutionary heritage. And this is really the word I love to use is that our evolutionary heritage is to be safe in the presence of another appropriate mammal. And for mm. some people that appropriate mammal may not be humans. Let's put it in the, in the most blatant, blunt terms. What enables people to be their creative self, to be their loving self, to be who they are? What enables people to enable their core to shine as opposed to this, protect themselves, fearful, quote, they'll be discovered, fearful that they're not good enough or fearful that their parents don't make enough money. You know, it's all these types of stuff labels that affect everyone. And the, the answer is, it, it's a, it's a, academics for me was a wonderful world because I was able to navigate into an area that I was actually redefining. I was defining it into mm. my personal journey. And my personal journey was to really understand the human experience if we really want to capture it. So, and it led me not only into the neurophysiology, it led me into metrics to measure that neurophysiology. But I have not discussed one important part of that journey. I started to understand that we as social mammals went on an evolutionary journey. So our journey which can actually be seen in our own embryology, is how the cells that control the vagus, from which the vagus come, comes from your brain cell, literally go on a embryological ventral journey. They migrate towards the front of the brain stem from the back, where they get engaged with the neurons that control the face, the muscle of the face, and our voice. This is a remarkable transition. This is what enables mammals to communicate their physiological state to their conspecifics. How do you know, Forrest? How do you know if you're talking to someone and that person is a hateful person, an angry person, or is that person a sweet, engaging person? How do you know? Now, you've been on the microphone for several years now, and you have a sense of how the hour will go, and you have a sense of from the person's voice, you have a sense mm-hmm. of whether you'd like that person or is time almost done? You know, yeah. The, the answer is your body is responding to those cues. Mm-hmm. Now, those cues are really accurate broadcasting of that person's physiological state. And that is mm-hmm. the secret. The secret is that when we are, in a sense, when our physiology is in a state of threat, our voice reflects it, our face reflects mm-hmm. it. And it. And when we detect it, We react to it. That's an argument. It's like, how can you win an argument if someone is throwing threat cues at you and you react to those threat cues and you now send threat cues? You lose all your resources of being a negotiator or being a problem solver. I mean, there's just so much here we could do, you know, several more hours of conversation on this, Steve, but I know that I've only got you for about 15 more minutes. So um, I I have to kind of make choices about what I ask you about a little bit here. And so I'm going to kind of summarize a little bit and let me know what you think about this. So you're emphasizing over and over again the role of safety and how we relate to other people, how we live our lives. You're talking about this uh, complex, sophisticated physiological system that we have in the body that helps us regulate ourselves, um, helps us interpret whether or not we are safe, and then make choices based off of that safety experience, maybe as a way to kind of talk about it. If we uh, feel like we're not safe, we make certain kinds of choices. If we feel that we are safe, we make different choices. And that even infiltrates our experience of the world altogether, where you talk about in the book how people who are in a state of uh, more hyperactivation, they've got that low grade, whether it's sympathetic activation or whatever else is going on for a long period of time, they start interpreting situations very differently. And then you talked a little bit about how we can start kind of giving ourselves this gift. 
helping ourselves calm down, slow down, um, deliberately drop into those more uh, more ventral experiences, maybe a way to put it, those more relational yeah. experiences, and some of the ways in for people who maybe they don't have the most secure base of other people around them, but they've got a good pet. They've got a, they've got a good dog. They've got a good cat. Maybe there are some circumstances in their life where they can have a little interoception, mm. a little self-experience, a little neuroception, uh, look inside and go, you know, I feel more comfortable here. I feel a little bit safer here. And this is what I start doing when I'm in those environments. And maybe I can start kind of expanding the field mm -hmm. of where I can be that way. And then, you know, we get feedback from the world and we learn maybe that place isn't safe over there. Maybe I can't do that. Maybe I need to be a little bit more discerning about where I apply that. Is that like a pretty fair summary here so far? It, it's, it's a great summary. We can also add to it that there are certain tools. You know what this is? It's a kazoo. <laughs> it's so a kazoo, one, okay. One of the toolkits we have is slow exhalation because our ventral vagus works during exhalation. Uh, it starts to calm us down. So the kazoos are there because to play a kazoo, you have to exhale. So, uh, mm. so there are things that we can do. We can take uh, a deep breath and exhale slowly. And doing that slow exhalation, there's a calming effect of the vagus. It's like a vagal nerve stimulator. That calmingness slows time up. We get back into our body a little bit. So people talk about breathing exercises as if it's out there in esoteric land. It's not. It's very physiological. And if we want to get ourselves more anxious, we take longer inhalations and rapid exhalations, and we hyperventilate. The point is that we have to understand that we carry on board a, set of, a toolkit. Another one that a lot of people use is top-down visualizations, where they think of a very a positive event, a moment in which they felt safe in the arms of another, a picture of their loved one, something that puts a smile on their face. And when they have that, it's incompatible with the challenges they may be facing in reality. So we can start learning, in a sense, to play with our nervous system. We know yeah. that our nervous system is detecting signals of threat, but we know we can kind of attenuate some of those threat reactions with breath and certainly with some visualizations. Asking about some specific exercises that people can do. If you go on uh, YouTube or TikTok, or I, I don't know if you're on any of these platforms, Steve, but uh, yeah, probably not. But I'm just telling you, you're going to run into a million different videos of people uh, talking about different vagus nerve exercises you can do for self-soothing. A lot of those exercises that people do are things like gentle massage, mm. like kind of gently massaging mm. yourself kind of beneath the ear or something like that. Um, they're pretty surface level interventions along those lines. My understanding is that most of the stuff that uh, people do for direct vagus nerve stimulation is either auditory, like you were describing with the safe and sound protocol, or there are some uh, forms of electrical stimulation oh. I've heard about that can stimulate the vagus nerve directly. And I'm I'm wondering, just to do a little like fact checking here, are those kinds of surface level oh, yeah. massages or interventions could, effective there, for people? Helpful? You have a, a, a kind of a whole area which is called the baroreceptor area, carotid, the carotid sinus. You can massage the neck. So think about if you have a dog or a cat, you'll do this. Mm -hmm. When you do that to yourself, it will be calming as well. You know, there's another area, the forehead. You ever rub your forehead? Yeah, sure. Totally. Yeah, okay. I got the lines there to prove it. Okay. So the interesting <laughs> part there is right below the surface of the skin is our sense, uh, sensory pathways from the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal mm. nerve, everyone knows about, because when you go to a dentist, they're kind of giving you the injection uh, in your mouth so that you, your face gets numb. But this pathway is, is also trigeminal, but it goes to the area of the brainstem that I call the ventral vagal complex. So even though it's a trigeminal nerve, it functions very much like a vagal nerve stimulator. Mm. So, so there are a lot of things, things that we've done historically, like rubbing our, our forehead, rubbing our necks, uh, rocking, which mm -hmm. is a blood pressure bit. And if we think about special needs kids are often rockers, but what are they doing? They're trying to regulate their physiological state. So there are a lot of, these are physiological reactions. And then, of course, there are people who talk more Wim Hof model where you put ice water. That can trigger the dorsal vagus and you can pass out. 
So there are issues. Yeah, it affects the vagus, but you want to pass out. So it's better to have a better understanding of your neurophysiology. And there's, there's nothing wrong with it. There are electrical stimulators that look like a electric razor that you put against your neck, and it's quite effective. And also just to add a layer to this, if you're watching a video like that, what are you kind of, and you're doing a mirrored action with another person, what are you doing kind of? You're co-regulating in right. a manner of speaking, you know? You have that uh, that uh, bit of relationality layered onto it. You're soothing yourself. Your breathing's probably slowing down a little bit. You're tuning into your body. So in addition to the actual like uh, physical stimulation of the nerve itself, there's just all of this other stuff happening as well that's probably helping out. Well, uh, see, when people ask me, and they start using terms like hacking the vagus. I said, forget it. Sure. You're missing the point. Yeah. We we came into this world with a very efficient vagal nerve stimulator. It's called sociality, which is what you're describing. So our need for social nourishment is the same thing as saying, I need a vagal stimulation. The the idea is that it puts the puts the stimulation within a social context while we want to fix things outside of a social context. And I think it's kind of dangerous in our world. Well, Steve, thank you so much for doing this with me today. I think that's a great note to leave our conversation with, just emphasizing once again the, impo the importance of that relational aspect of this whole thing. Well, thank you, Forrest. Enjoy talking to you. I had a great time talking with Dr. Stephen Porges today about the polyvagal theory and his new book, Polyvagal World. Steve offered a brief summary of polyvagal theory at the beginning of the conversation, and we referred to the physiology a few times throughout, but I thought it might be helpful to go into a bit more detail here at the end of the conversation. Polyvagal theory starts with the vagus nerve, the longest and most complex of the cranial nerves that connect the brain to the body. It's what allows the brain to regulate the body's viscera, including the heart, lungs, and the gastrointestinal tract. And the vagus nerve has two source nuclei. This is the nucleus ambiguous and the dorsal motor nucleus. These two nuclei are connected to two separate but related vagal systems that serve these different evolutionary purposes. And polyvagal theory can really be summarized as the view that these two vagal systems are programmed with different kinds of response strategies. What do we do in response to stress? Most of the cells in the dorsal vagal complex connects with the stomach and the intestines. Then, on the other hand, most of the cells in the ventral vagal complex connect with structures located above the diaphragm, and then related to these nerve systems is the sympathetic nervous system as a whole, which is a system of mobilization that allows the body to adapt to stress by activating the fight-or-flight response. And polyvagal theory suggests that our responses to stress are dictated, at least in part, by these three systems. When we enter a dorsal vagal state in response to stress, we tend to freeze or shut down. And an example of this might be dissociating during a particularly challenging conversation with a romantic partner. Then when we enter a more sympathetic state, we move to fight or flight. The heartbeat rises and maybe we start to perspire a little bit. And then when we're in a ventral vagal state, and this is really important, we're able to stay in relationship with other people. The VVC, that's the ventral vagal complex, is connected to our social engagement system, which includes things like the muscles that control our facial expressions. And according to polyvagal theory, co-regulation is the reciprocal sending and receiving of signals of safety. When we co-regulate, our social engagement system signals the people we're around that the environment is safe and that we can stay in this ventral vagal system without entering one of the body's two threat response systems. That's again, the dorsal vagus and then the sympathetic nervous system. And a key point here is that each of these three systems are adaptive. They're all serving a different kind of purpose in response to different kinds of threats. We've got the dorsal vagus that shuts us down and conserves energy, the sympathetic system, that's what allows us to mobilize up and run away, and then we have the ventral vagus, which is about that social connection system, which helped us survive in our small groups of people and kept our ancestors alive hundreds of thousands of years ago. Each of these systems has a purpose, but the first two of them, the dorsal vagus and the sympathetic system, have a lot of consequences for our body when they're activated over long periods of time. So to summarize my summary here, 
when we experience ourselves as being in a safe environment, the ventral vagal complex and related experiences of social engagement and connection become more accessible to us. When we feel like there could be some kind of danger or the environment is perceived as unsafe, the sympathetic nervous system is more likely to be activated alongside related experiences of either excitement or stress. And then when our life feels like it's truly being threatened, we're experiencing some other kind of traumatic event. The dorsal vagal system is more likely to move us into immobilization and dissociation. So how does the body determine which of these systems we should be using in different situations? Our nervous system is constantly taking in sensory information from both the external environment and from inside our own bodies, and then it evaluates the risk that we're exposed to based on this sensory information. And Dr. Porges coined the term neuroception to describe how this process happens and how our body determines whether a situation is safe or dangerous or even life-threatening for a person. One of the big problems here is that the experiences that we have change our ability to perceive the situations we're in. And this is why people who've been in difficult situations or have experienced trauma often have a hard time perceiving environments as safe even if they seem perfectly fine to another person. Then layered on top of that, signals of safety themselves can be really threatening to someone. And this was such a cool part of the conversation with Steve. Many of the things that happen to people happen to them in environments they perceive as safe. Their homes, their family situations, uh, the places where we feel like we should be able to let our guard down. So if you're somebody who's had those experiences, who's walking around in a state of constant vigilance, safety signals themselves become threatening. Because why would I show my vulnerable belly to you when only bad things have happened when I did that in the past? And that took us into a conversation focused on reparative experiences. What are the things that can help us soothe these bodily systems, and how can we apply our knowledge of them to help us in a variety of different ways. And Steve focused here on the importance of safe relationships as the way in to accessing the ventral vagus. This could be a relationship with another person, or it could be a relationship with another animal, like a wonderful pet. He also talked about the importance of self-awareness and interoception, getting better at tuning into the body's sensations and being aware of its needs. And then we talked about some specific strategies. These are could be meditative practices, deep breathing, listening to calming sounds or music, even just rocking the body bath and forth. Anything that helps you experience safety and comfort. And then particularly, anything that helps you experience co-regulation with another nervous system. We also talked briefly at the end about various forms of direct vagal nerve stimulation including some of the vagus nerve exercises that are often shared on places like YouTube or TikTok, and particularly the role that all of the other stuff plays in these exercises. You're mirroring somebody you're watching on the video, so there's a feeling of relationship. Maybe you're slowing your breathing down, you're being conscious of your body, you're taking care of your needs. All of these things just help us feel good. In addition to whatever is going on with the uh, massage or stimulation that's happening itself, all of these other things are a piece of the puzzle, too. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Dr. Steve Porges. Again, his new book is Polyvagal World, which he wrote with his son, Seth. If you've been enjoying the conversation for a while, we'd appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe to it wherever you're listening or watching now. Uh, that might be on YouTube. Maybe that's in your podcast feed. Maybe it's on Spotify. Hey, wherever you subscribe to it sounds great to me. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for just a few dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return. Until next time, thanks for listening and I'll talk to you soon.